Good morning, Jonathan. Morning has broken, and here we are, your consecrated hosts. Jonathan, consecrated by baptism. Oh, Father Jeff, consecrated by holy orders. It's a frightening day today. No, it's not. It's the eve of all Hallows Eve. <laughs> all Hallows Eve Eve. <laughs> Halloween ween. It's as close as <laughs> they will get to that, so. Oh, I know, and it's a full moon this thanks or Thanksgiving, this Halloween. It's a full moon on Halloween. Oh, no. I didn't think I'd see one of those for a while again, but here it is. Right now. Yeah, halloween -ing. That's what we're going to call it. The Eve of the Eve of All Hallows. You dressing up? I don't know. Hmm. I'm not sure what we're doing. We should have come in costume today. Missed opportunities. Put some masks on us right now, Jonathan. All right, there we go. All right. <laughs> that was scary for all of you. <laughs> um, so here's what I thought we were going to do today. I, we're we're kind of done. We kind of went through um, citizenship and faithful participation in the process and all of that kind of stuff. And... We're just going to put that aside now well, because we've talked it to death. Much like many of you. We we're, are done. We're done. We're over with the election. <laughs> we're done. We're just, you know, waiting for January 20-whatever when the inauguration has happened. 2021. We can, when we can all 2021. get on with our lives. <laughs> Today, uh, I mentioned to you earlier this week that on Tuesday, uh, RCIA night, I normally live stream the RCIA uh, class on our website so that those who want to participate either live or watch it later can do so. You know, it, yeah. it's a good opportunity for Catholics. It's like, oh, I wish I was able to go to RCIA and learn all the stuff that these, you know, people wanting to become Catholic are doing. Mm -hmm. So I decided to make that a thing. And it, so RCIA is available on the website. Yep, you can um, find it. And on our Vimeo page. Yep. So, however... However, when I went to um, do the live streaming on Tuesday night, I pushed the record button instead of the live stream button. And my phone started recording about 10 minutes. And then it said, memory full, we're not going to record you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and so we didn't get it done. So I thought what we'd do today is we would cover the topic that I covered on Tuesday and redirect all of our faithful RCIA watchers to today's morning show. Excellent. And our topic is? Mary da -da -da -da. and the Saints. And that's appropriate since All Saints Day is like this weekend. So it's even it topical to our morning show chit-chat. Well, in some ways I did dress up. You, you're wearing your Mary Blue. My Mary Blue. And your All Saints socks. My Mary socks. Mary socks. <laughs> well, good for you. I'm wearing my um, my All Saints ensemble. I like it. Yeah. So, let's start with Mary. Mary. The Virgin Mary. You know, most non-Catholics would uh, levy certain objections. Catholics worship Mary... Um, what else? Uh, Catholics um, skip Jesus and use Mary as an intercessor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that she's somehow more than human. I don't know, all these different things. Right. None of those are true. That as Catholics, uh, the Catholic Church, I think, has always lifted up Mary uh, in order to teach us more about Christ. Like, we don't bother talking about Mary unless it gets us closer to Christ. Yeah. And, and so that becomes... Um, Without Christ, Mary is nothing. <laughs> she's, she's just a girl. <laughs> she's, yeah, I mean, her whole, her whole reason for, for uh, the participation in the plan of salvation, the reason we care about her uh, more than any other human being, is because of her role in yeah. uh, salvation history. Yeah, I mean, she would have been still a really good person, yada, yada, but... Like you or me. Kind of in... in insignificant in as insignificant as you can be she was called to something more yeah exactly so i think the first thing that uh, we recognize is the great title that she received at the council of ephesus back in the 400s uh the church was still at the time arguing 
who is Jesus? Is he is he God? Is he man? Is he man God? Is he God man? Does his divinity uh, take over his humanity? Is his humanity just a puppet for his divinity? You know, all of these sorts of. I mean, it was crazy. We think the the church sometimes is messed up today. Uh, go back to the early centuries. No, nope. there was nope. there, there was no internet, no resources, no nothing to go to and say, oh, that's what the catechism says. There's no catechism. There was no catechism. <laughs> So, the Bible had just been put together. They, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, the Bible was a fairly new thing in terms of one one book. And all handwritten. I know. Can you imagine? If you aren't good, I'm going to make you copy three pages of the Bible and add them to our collection so we can <laughs> hand them out. Um, so Mary was given the title Theotokos, which literally means the God-bearer. In English, we often say Mother of God. Because if you're going to bear a child into the world, um, we don't say, oh, this is my father and my bearer. <laughs> this is my father and my mother. So, uh, yeah. So Mary was given the title Mother of God, which really concretized and taught that uh, Jesus is not just human. That she didn't just give birth to a human. Right. But she gave birth to someone who is God and man. And so Jesus is not just human, but Jesus is God. Ergo, Mary is the mother of God. Fully human, fully divine. You got it. Two natures, one person. So we get this, we get this teaching about Mary as uh, the mother of God, really teaching us about Jesus. Mm-hmm. Now, in order to be the mother of God, um, God is without sin. And when sin is, when sin comes in contact with God, it's destroyed. You know, it is, shadows don't live in the light. You know, if you shine light on a shadow, shadow's gone. That's why we have this light here. It takes away the shadows. Except I didn't shave today, so I, don't I have a big shadow. I don't any shadows. <sighs> you Not don't. on camera, I don't. No. I have a shadow. I didn't shave today. It's Friday. It's Friday. Right now. You have to, you got to get ready for this weekend and all the trick-or-treaters. So you need to be, well, I don't know if you're going to even be doing trick-or-treating. But either way. I'm closing my door, turning off my lights, pretending I'm not home. <laughs> I'm just going to be that guy. <laughs> yeah. It's, don't come to my house. Hey, it's, it, you, got, you're not you have to be safe. If you go down, the whole ship goes down. I know. No coronavirus for me. Well, I can wear a mask, but I don't want to wear a mask in my own home. Anywho. Your answer is Darth Vader. Oh, I have that costume. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> point. I got excited there. For it's a Friday. <laughs> All right. So Mary needs to be prepared to be the mother of God. Yeah. So she cannot have any sin. So what, one of the things that the church has taught about Mary is that she's been sinless from the moment of her conception. And we call that mystery the Immaculate Conception. Mm. Celebrated on... Oh, good grief. I, you know, I'm stumped. December 8th. December 8th. I knew that. You knew, of course you knew that. Yeah, it's celebrated on <laughs> December 8th. I just like, Jonathan, on quick. spot. This Birth spot. of Christ? <laughs> December 25th. All right, you're not, you're, you, we'll still count you as Catholic. <laughs> so like most Catholics, you have no idea what the Immaculate Conception of Mary is or when it is. No, you do. What is the Immaculate Conception, Jonathan? Explain immaculate for Conception? Many times people think it's the conception of Jesus. That's wrong. That's wrong. <laughs> it is the moment that Mary was conceived immaculately, a- a.k.a. without sin. Exactly. Within the womb of her mother. Mm-hmm. So we, we have this tradition from one of the, the non-official gospels. I think it's the Gospel of James that uh, tells the story of Mary's parents, Joachim and Anne. And that's where we get their names. And they talk about uh, raising... Is that where we got that? I guess that would be the only place. What? Joachim and Anne. Yes. I haven't thought about that. So that's how we... I don't think we have the lineage yes. of... Yeah. Sorry. So Joachim and Anne, uh, parents of Mary. And what, what happens there is that there's two ways that Mary included. All people need to be saved by Jesus Christ. Because we, are, we, we come into this broken humanity that Adam and Eve messed up for us. And we now inherit this broken humanity from our parents, from their parents, blah, 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 all the way back. So God needs to save every one of us, including the Virgin Mary. There are two ways to save a person. 
let's pretend you're walking along the road, the path in, in India, and uh, you, the, you know, there's tigers that roam there in, in India. And so to catch a tiger, you dig a, a pit and cover it with, you know, palm branches mm -hmm. or whatnot. And so Jonathan's walking along and he falls into the pit. There he is, down in this pit. It's too high for him to climb out, so he needs to be saved. This is the state of most human beings. We, we fall into this pit uh, unknowingly, original sin, sin of Adam and Eve, and now you need to be saved. So here I come along and I lift you out of that pit. So Jesus comes and he pulls you out of the pit. He puts his cross down there so you can climb out of it. And we encounter that salvation now through baptism. So you encounter the cross through baptism. That's how everyone is saved except one person. There is another way to save you from the pit. As you're walking along, do, 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 I say, Jonathan, you almost stepped into a pit. I prevent you from falling, a prevent, a pre-going. I stop you as you are going so that you do not fall into, I still saved you, but I saved you before you were tainted by sin. That's the Immaculate Conception, that in the moment of Mary's conception, that the Lord immediately at that moment shields her from original sin, saves her from original sin. Because remember, for God the Father, he sees all time at once. So he sees his son dying on the cross and saving the world, and he applies that salvation to Mary in her mother's womb so that she is preserved from sin. Does that mean that Mary has no concupiscence? Correct. Concupiscence is the uh, tendency towards sin because you are broken. Right. And you, it's like when you, if you break your finger or your ankle or whatever, and even though it's healed, when the weather changes, you feel it. You feel that, that in, your, in your joints. There's that wound that continues to ache. Concupiscence is the inclination to sin. So Mary did not have the, the, the ache. She didn't have the concupiscence. That's a good point. So she was like Eve. She's the new Eve. She was without sin, in a relationship with God, and she chose always to be obedient to God rather than to be disobedient. So she shows us what humanity, what discipleship is supposed to be. So in some sense, she is not greater than humanity. She shows us what humanity is supposed to be. Yeah. Every one of us who sins are less than human. So it's not that Mary's greater than humans or superhuman. She's exactly human. And anybody who sins is less than yeah. human. She's the most fully human. Exactly. That's a good point. She's the most fully human, aside from Jesus Christ himself. But he's also, got that whole other nature. That that's right. He's also like divine. But Mary is not cheating. divine. 100% human. Yeah. Human, human, human. Nothing added. No additives or preservatives. I well, I guess there's a preservative. <laughs> but no additives. <laughs> She was preserved from original sin. So this, this, this theory, not theory, but theology of the Immaculate Conception then, it's, uh, it's something that makes sense that, of course, God, in order for God to become a human being and not obliterate the humanity that he receives, that it must be an unstained humanity. And in order, so what Mary does is, as mother of God, she provides the body for Jesus Christ. So he is literally, really related to the Virgin Mary because he took her humanity. She provided her humanity. Now, some people might say, well, isn't that a step too far? Couldn't God just intervened in the conception of the son in Mary's womb and preserved him and, and not saved Mary? God can do anything. He can but he also likes to work within the natural realm. Yes. And not only that, he respects our choice. So what, 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 if God would have done that, see, in the womb of, of Mother Anne, St. Anne, Mary is saved as a whole person. When she is conceived, she is saved. 
if God would have done that with Jesus, what what God would have said to Mary is, it, Jesus would not needed to have been saved. Obviously, he is the Savior. So what God would have said is like, Mary, I'm not going to save you, but I am going to redeem and save one of your egg cells. <laughs> And so allow me to use you as an object for salvation. That is, I mean, the, 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 I mean, it's, it's laughable. Yeah. I mean, it is, so, so God doesn't do that. He's not going to save a gamete. He's going to save a human being. He saves Mary, a person, so that she can bring the Savior into the world. He doesn't use her to say, I'm going to leave you a sinner, Mary, and save your egg cells. God has never used any person ever no. for any reason. No, no, no. It, it, it wasn't until... Because Mary had that choice. She could have said no. She could have said no. <clears throat> right. And and that was where God opens an invitation. His invitation is always there. Right. But it's upon each and every individual to either accept or deny. And God respects it. Absolutely. And he's not just going to use you because it's like, oh, I need to work salvation. So you've got something I need. I'm going to take it from you and, and leave you there still in the gutter. Love does not use. And God is love. Exactly. So the Immaculate Conception logically has to happen. And then here's the, here's the thing that just blew my mind away when, when I learned this. So on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. December 8th. December 8th. <laughs> Uh, the readings proposed for that Mass are significant. The first reading is from Genesis, the story of the fall. Like, here's our problem. The second reading and the Gospel then provide the solution. The Gospel reading is the Annunciation. When the angel Gabriel comes to Mary and asks her to be the mother of the, the Son of God. Which is why people get the Immaculate Conception and the Annunciation confused. And the middle reading, the letter from St. Paul, is his letter to the Galatians. And what's interesting is when the angel Gabriel greets Mary, he says to her, Hail, Mary, full of grace. Or it's translated differently in different scriptures. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's full of grace. Sometimes it's um, highly favored one. Uh, most blessed, um, you know, different things. That, not a typical way to greet someone. Not a typical way. But the word that is used, the word that St. Luke uses there is kikairatomene. Kikairatomene is a Greek word that means hail, one having been blessed, mm. one having been graced. That's what it really means, one having been graced. So it's a past act that continues into the present. So hail one having been graced, the Lord is with you. That word is used only one other time in the entire Bible. It is used in St. Paul's letter to the Galatians, and it is used to describe the effect upon a Christian after baptism. Hmm. Salvation. So, when St. Paul describes a Christian who encounters the blood of Christ on the cross, he is graced, kakairotomene. Mary is greeted by the angel as one who has exactly the same effect as someone who has been baptized, one who has been saved, one whose original sin has been taken away. So the angel Gabriel recognizes in Mary and calls her the Immaculate Conception without her even knowing it. And if you know your scripture, and if you know your Bible, all of you Silva Scriptura people, there it is, the Immaculate Conception, right there. <laughs> Don't read it in some English translation. Go read it in the Greek and learn a thing or two. So how does that? Boom. <laughs> Mic drop. <laughs> So the, the mystery of the Immaculate Conception uh, necessarily leads then to the end of Mary's life. Mm -hmm. You suppose Mary died? How would, how would you talk about that, Jonathan? 
I know there is no official church teaching on that part, so I could start with that. <laughs> um, I'd like to think. Well, I know it's a. It, I'd like to because I can since it's not an official church. You teaching, go right ahead, John. I'd like to think that she didn't actually die. Okay. But I have no basis for it. Well, we can think this through. So, in the Immaculate Conception, Mary is perver- preserved from sin. She maintains that ever blessedness that we 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 know of her not sinning throughout her life. So, without having encountered sin, um, not having concupiscence and the incl- inclination to sin, saying yes to God instead of saying no to God. Um, we know that the effects of sin are death. Right. And if Mary did not sin, she could not have died in what we understand death to be, the ripping apart of soul and body. So because of that, the church has always taught that at the end of her earthly life, Mary simply entered into heaven. Now, we don't know what that looks like. Right. There's no tales or written exactly. history of... We just know that she entered into heaven. The Eastern traditions will describe that as the dormition of Mary. Mm-hmm. She falls to sleep in this world and wakes up body and soul in eternity. Uh, the, the Roman, the Western tradition, will talk about it as the assumption of Mary, that Mary is assumed into heaven at the end of her cor- er, earthly life. Both, both the ways of describing it uh, lead us to the fact that she is in heaven, body and soul. You cannot go visit her grave. No. It, it, you will find an empty tomb. And <clears throat> with that, I mean, we have relics of the true cross. We have St. Paul. We have all of the... Famous people. If Mary would have stayed body here, there sure would have been some kind of relic. Oh my gosh, people would have flocked to that grave. I mean, the mother of the Son of God, hello. uh, She would have been, she was a famous person. Yeah, with with the the minor, relatively minor things that were preserved at that time. Yep, yep, yep. She disappeared. She's gone. You know, and, and, and even 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 if we move into some of the dubious things, that people so want these things to be true, mm-hmm. that I think there's at least three heads of John the Baptist floating around out there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's three like different churches that claim to have the head of John the Baptist. Um, and so it's like, it's, we want this to be true so badly. But nobody claims to have any bit of the Virgin Mary's body, her bones, her relics, her... her her skeleton, her her body in a grave. Nobody claims that because the church knows that her body was assumed into heaven. That makes me happy. It does. Because that's the promise for all of us. Yeah. You know, the great thing, Jonathan, is that whatever the church teaches about Mary, the church is really teaching about herself, about the church. If Mary is without sin, we could say the church is without sin. If Mary is the bride of the Holy Spirit, we can say the church is the bride of God. If we say that the, that the church has a place in heaven, Mary has a place in heaven. The church is obedient to God, Mary is obedient to God. The church uh, brings forth Christ into the world, Mary brings forth Christ into the world. Mary is the perfect image of the church. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason <clears throat> the church holds her so highly. Yeah, it's it like a mirror for us. Mirror, perfect model of... Well, we should try to emulate, who try we are to be. called to be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Whatever is, the church teaches about Mary, the church ultimately teaches about Jesus Christ, but also points back and says, this is the promise for you. Yeah. That's the beautiful thing, is if, if you look towards Mary, or, you know, as Protestants would think, we worship Mary. Yep. Anything of Mary, all that her does is going to Christ. Absolutely. There's no part of her that does not lead you to Christ. Absolutely. And that's the only way Mary would have it. She doesn't want any glory. She doesn't want anything because she knows. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. When you read the, um, the book of Revelation, chapter 12, uh, it's the great story of the woman and the dragon. And it's a fantastic story about this woman who is 
clothed with the sun, standing upon the moon, with a crown of stars around her head. She is with child about to give birth, and when she does give birth, she gives birth to the, the shepherd of the nations who rules with an iron rod, and, um, and the serpent there is ready to devour her child, but she is preserved from him, and uh, she's taken to a place of safety, and the serpent who is lost now waits by the river to consume or to, to, to wage war on all of her children. And a lot of people will look at that image and say, oh, that's, that's the image of Mary. And in fact, the description looks identical to Our Lady of Guadalupe. Yeah. You know, the woman clothed with the sun on the moon, you know, stars, that's a pr pregnant with child, blah, 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 blah. But that's not the image of the Virgin Mary. Mm. That's the image in Revelation. It's the image of the church. John is describing the church who brings Christ into the world and all the other children related to Christ. And so the serpent hangs out by the waters, by the baptismal font, to consume the children of the church. Screw tape says, as they, the steps of the altar. Exactly. That that is the place where, the, where he's going to hang out. So, But what, what that shows us is this is what the image of the church looks like. And the Virgin Mary herself appeared to St. Juan Diego in that very form. Yeah. As the woman of revelation, which is amazing. You That's know, beautiful. when you see these, these Marian apparitions. And, uh, you know, there's a lot. She gets around. She's got some frequent fire miles, <laughs> I think. <laughs> but, you know, if anybody is going to appear to human beings on earth, it's going to be someone with their body. Mary's got the body to show. That's true. And so, you know, she's like, hey, here I am. I have my, you know, flesh and blood. You can see me. Uh, so she's, she's good that way. She doesn't forget her children. Yeah. So that, uh, that mystery then of the assumption of Mary is the natural conclusion to the Immaculate Conception. That she, she must have a place in heaven. August 15th. That is August 15th. Good job. <laughs> and Mary, Mother of God? Oh, shoot. I don't know that one. I'm not even going to pretend. January 1st. I had a thought, maybe, but I didn't want to look stupid. Solemnity of Mary, the Holy Mother of God. So all these topics, that are these titles that we were talking about today. I knew that one. Have, you knew that, Jonathan. Yeah. Six, I'm holy, more six holy days of obligation in the United States. Oh, I don't know them all. We just, Immaculate Conception, Immaculate December Conception. 8th. 8th. Mary, Mother of God. January 1st. We've already said the Assumption of Mary, August, August 15th. 15th. Birth of Christ, December 25th. December 25th. Ascension of Christ. Oh, I have no. 40 problem. days after Easter. Oh, because that one is only like six dioceses. In I know. Days in out. some places, they move it to Sunday. And then All Saints Day. Oh, which November is 1st. Up, it's coming up around the corner, but it falls on Sunday this year, so it's a twofer. So two, then, twofer but then special. All Saints Day over does Sunday? Yes. So it will not be a green Sunday this weekend. It will be white, Ooh. celebrating the sanctity of uh, all the blessed in heaven. So what else do we have to talk about Mary? We've got her immaculate. Her, she, we, we recognize Mary also as being ever virgin. Mm -hmm. That she um, was preserved. She says to the angel, I do not have relations with a man. How could I be pregnant? Um, and even though she's betrothed to Joseph, Joseph's vocation was unique. He was called to be the uh, protector of Mary and, jo and Jesus. Um, not to be a generator of, of children. One of the things that the church has always pointed to is that, A, if, if Mary had other children, um, they certainly would have had a, a place in the church of privilege, just like Mary herself had a place of privilege, that Jesus' flesh and blood family would have been, you know, there would have been notoriety there. Secondly, uh, when Jesus is on the cross, and Mary is standing beneath. He enacts uh, basically a legal, uh, he executes his will. Yeah. And he looks to John, a friend of his, the beloved disciple, and he says, behold your mother, mother behold your son. And there, that's kind of a, an act of the will, a legal act that says, this woman now is, is left bereft. She is a widow. She has no children to take care of her. And so rather than leave her at, at the edge of society, I give her to you to take care of. 
because in the culture in the day, woman, uh, a woman needed to be a part of a man's household. Otherwise, she was, you know, widows and orphans are in the Jewish law because they have no one to take care of them. And so the law recognized them as, you know, you need to give charity to these people because they don't have a house. They don't have a family. Yeah. So I was, and that's the official passing is, you know, John, behold your mother. Yep. Mother, behold your son. And that also spiritually applies to us. Yeah. Because whenever we pray to Mary, you can think of it as uh, us standing with John or in the place of John next to the Virgin Mary under the cross of Christ. So we are beholding Christ, we're imploring Christ, we're looking to Christ, we're recognizing that everything comes from him, but we're standing with Mary because she shows us how to more perfectly approach Christ. And it just puts us in that right relationship. Yeah. You know, when you're standing with, with mom, <laughs> you're gentled, you know, yeah. you're whatever. I'm calmed and nurtured. I mean, it's, but yeah, then, She's she proofreads the prayers, if you will. <laughs> oh, that's a good way. Yeah, to you know, send them up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just part of being being part of the family with with Christ, and He gave us the, His mother to to support us and to protect us and to do what moms do. And it's not to take anything away from Him, but as Mary says, it's to magnify Jesus. So I think, in a nutshell, uh, we could go on and on about the Blessed Virgin Mary. We could just make it a Blessed Virgin Mary show. We could have Blessed Virgin Mary Month, which we do, but not on this show. Um, so there's a lot about Mary, but let's let's shift into the, the communion of saints for a second. Okay. Because also, Catholics get the same, um, you know, accusation that, these oh, you idols. Idols, worship of saints, you know, blah, 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 takes away from Jesus' one intercession, this, that, and the other thing. Um... There's a concept in Catholicism that many other Christians have forgotten, and that is the notion of what it means to be Christ. That Jesus of Nazareth, Son of God and Son of Mary, was the Christ, the Anointed One of God, the Messiah. So, being Christ, he then joins us on Pentecost to himself by sharing his spirit. By sharing the Holy Spirit, he joins all of his members to himself. So if you picture the body of Christ, head and members, Jesus is the head of the whole body of Christ. And we, by the power of the Holy Spirit, baptism in the Holy Spirit, have been joined to Jesus the head, so that, as St. Paul says, we form one body. We are one body, one body in Christ. That was our World Youth Day song in 1993. And, and we do not stand there. alone. That's a beautiful song. Shut your mouth. So, <laughs> we, <laughs> we, got, we, we got this notion of what Christ is. And, you know, we see it in Pentecost. Mary, with the other disciples, uh, the apostles, and the holy women. The Holy Spirit was poured upon them, joined them all together as one body to the Son of God. Mm -hmm. When Catholics talk about Christ, the body of Christ. We are talking about not just Jesus the head, but Jesus united through the Holy Spirit to all his members to form this one body which he himself desired. Points of clarification. This is not in reference to the physical body of Christ in the Eucharist, or is? Oh. Um... <laughs> the physical body of Christ is not present in the Eucharist. The sacramental body of Christ, the real presence, is present. Yes. The physical body is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Correct. Sorry. Very fine, minute point. There. That's a good clarification. But but when we're talking about the body of Christ, when you... you I'm talking Christ about St. Paul's describing the body, of the mystical body of Christ. Got it. Let's talk about Just the mystical... There's in case anybody can get a little confused, because this can be confusing, I wanted to make right. sure... Right. <laughs> yes. So you have 
the glorified body of Christ in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. You have the body of Christ sacramentally, where the real presence of Christ is given to us in the Holy Eucharist. You have the mystical body of Christ, which is, and all of these things are united in some way. They cannot be separated. The body of Christ, the mystical body of Christ, cannot be the mystical body of Christ if we're not joined to the glorified body and feed upon the sacramental body. That, that everything is, is just different expressions of the one body of Christ. So the, there is a real presence of Christ in the mystical body of the church. There is a real presence of Christ glorified in heaven. There is the real presence of Christ in the host on the altar. Real and full presence. All of them. All of them are, are united together. And they need to be, otherwise it all falls apart. You pull one thread, psh, the whole thing collapses. That's true. It is. So all of this, the body of Christ, all of these people filled with the Holy Spirit, joined to Jesus is the body of Christ. So when I pray to a saint, I am praying to a member of the body of Christ, that this saint is united to Jesus the head in a slightly different way than I am united to Jesus the head. And if I, if I am directing my prayer to Saint Anthony, I am directing my prayer to Christ. And if I direct my prayer to St. Margaret Mary, I am directing my prayer to Christ. That what, what Mary says in, in St. Luke's Gospel when she goes to meet Elizabeth, and Elizabeth looks at her and recognizes Christ, Elizabeth says, blessed are you among women. And Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord. You see him better because of what he has done in me. The Magnificat? Magnificat. My soul magnifies the Lord. Um, and every saint does that. Like That's why Jesus keeps adding people to his body, so that he is more and more seen and visible. Well, and that's, I guess you could use that as a different definition of a saint. The capital S saint is this person's life magnifies <clears throat> the Lord. And that's why we recognize them. So there's the lowercase s and the capital S. Lowercase s, saint, a holy one. St. Paul describes the holy ones. Whenever he writes a letter, I write to the saints of Corinth or the saints of Ephesus. I write to the holy ones of Ephesus. The holy. If you have been baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit, you are a saint. Yeah, right. That, you have that been is, made holy. <clears throat> we are all called to be saints. Yes. And to be saints forever in heaven. Mm -hmm. The church then highlights certain men and women uh, and bestows upon them the capital S title, Saint, as a way to say, okay, so what does this look like? Here's an example. Here's a model. Here's someone that you could look to. And the, the process of canonization it, with the official naming of a capital S Saint is to, um, at least now in the modern age, is to study this person's life, to collect all of his or her writings, to gather um, testimony from witnesses, <clears throat> and to say, yeah, that person lived a heroic life. There was virtue there. There's something that we can learn from. There's something we can model our lives on. And then we ask them to prove it. <laughs> yes. so, something that, so that's not even something you... That's why we're not called to be capital canonized saints. Right. Because then we'd be doing try to do ridiculous things. Yeah. And it's posthumously. Yeah, so they're needs, dead. This is a dead person now. There needs to be miracle. So you look at John Paul II, for example. And John Paul II, uh, mo many people recognized him to be a saint when he was alive. Uh, after he died his cause was immediately begun, that he was a model, he was a saint, we know he was, he must be in heaven, here's all the reasons why, all right, JP2, you need to prove it. So we need a miracle mm -hmm. that's worked on behalf of your intercession. And uh, I believe uh, a miracle occurred with a little Carmelite nun who was suffering, suffering from Parkinson's disease, and she was cured of her Parkinson's, and, uh, you know, it's especially tied to John Paul II, who yeah. himself died of that disease, uh, had Parkinson's. And so it was, uh, you know, there was a connection there. People knew of the intercession. Um, 
And so there's usually a two-step process. It's a multi-step process, but the main two steps, beatification and canonization, that a person is declared blessed when a miracle has been happening you know, and, and cannot be described, like no reason given, no earthly right. reason given. And then when a second miracle and the cause continues, then a person is canonized. So this Saturday, tomorrow, the United States will uh, celebrate the beatification of the first parish priest ever beatified in the United States. Uh, the founder of the Knights of Columbus, Father Michael J. McGivney from Connecticut, uh, has his cause has been waiting. A miracle happened about five years ago or so, uh, which was approved just this past May by the Holy Father after it had gone through a panel of experts and doctors and whatnot. Uh, a little boy who was the son of a, a Knight of Columbus, um, when they found out that they were pregnant with him, uh, he, was, he was going to have Down syndrome and a, de a debilitating disease that would take his life shortly after birth. And when he was born, um, he, he did not die as everyone expected him to. And in fact, that disease that he had uh, was not present. And they had prayed during the pregnancy to Father McGivney. And uh, that child is now five years old. And um, Father McGivney will be beatified in uh, Connecticut this Saturday. I think you can watch it on EWTN and uh, on the internets. And, uh, you know, hopefully one day be canonized and be a saint. That's really cool. Yeah. I mean, he was an impressive man himself. So the reason we canonize men and women is to demonstrate that you, a person like you, can achieve sanctity in the world in which you live. Yeah, a really cool one recently, um, blessed Carlo Acutis, mm -hmm. who was, um, he was a teenager. A couple weeks ago. Yeah, just a couple weeks ago. Right. Teenager, um, and was really involved in media. His parents weren't faithful at all, but he went to Mass and saw, he felt, he knew. Mm -hmm. And so he went to Mass every day, um, and really wanted to make known the Eucharistic miracles. This was one of the biggest things yeah. in his life. And so he started a YouTube channel. This is years ago of just of the Eucharistic miracles in the world and just trying to get the message of the Eucharist yeah. out to the world. And um, he's a blessed now. And, and we had the Eucharistic miracles display last year at St. Charles, which is based on and from the work that he did. Yeah, it, it was incredible because he's a teenage kid yep. who had lived in this world. I mean, he was buried in Nikes and uh, <laughs> like a hoodie. Yeah. Um, and cool fact, when they took his body out, because whenever someone becomes a blessed or anything else, they exhume the body. Yeah. Um, and he is not corrupted at all. How long has he been dead? It's right here. He died this <laughs> date, and they took his body out, and I'll put a picture of him. There we go. Because he yeah. looks, I mean... He looks like you and I. So he might be a, a thank you for saying I look young. <laughs> I said you and I. I didn't say you and I. Hush <laughs> now. So the call to saints. Yes. The call to be saints. And so this Saturday or this Sunday, we will celebrate the Feast of All Saints, which really is a celebration of all the holy men and women who are joined to the body of Christ in heaven, whether we know their names, they were specifically canonized or not. All of those people that you may have lived with, known, your relatives who are now in heaven enjoying the beatitude, they are going to be celebrated this Sunday. And it is a reminder that that's where, where we ourselves belong. Yeah, that's so cool since, you know, people like St. Peter get their own feast days. Exactly. You know, all these unknowns. Also get a feast day. They get a feast day and it's a holy day of obligation. It even is. More, even more so than, you know. Any individual. Some little... Other than the Blessed Virgin Mary, she gets many days. Yeah, she's pretty. She awesome. gets like the first Saturday of every month. So there's the there's the <laughs> saints and Mary and that kind of. So if if you were bummed out that the RCIA class d disappeared, didn't have happen, you were like, oh, Mary and the saints. I wanted to learn all about that. Here it is. We did the condensed version for you, and, and you got me with it too. Yeah, so. which you would not have gotten before. So it's far more interesting, I am sure. <laughs> Enjoy your celebration of All Saints. Happy Halloween, Eam. And uh, don't eat too much candy. We'll see you on Tuesday. Tuesday. November 3rd, Election Day. Bye-bye.